Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we begin with Thomas Paine on the origin of Freemasonry. On the origin of Freemasonry, it is always understood that Freemasons have a secret which they carefully conceal. But from everything that can be collected from their own accounts of Masonry, the real secret is no other than their origin, which but few of them understand, and those who do envelop it in mystery. The Society of Masons are distinguished into three classes or degrees. First, the Entered Apprentice. Second, the Fellow Craft. Third, the Master Mason. The Entered Apprentice knows but little more of masonry than the use of signs and tokens and certain steps and words by which masons can recognize each other without being discovered by a person who is not a mason. The fellow craft is not much better instructed in masonry than the inner apprentice. It is only the master mason's lodge that whatever knowledge remains of the origin of masonry is preserved and concealed. In 1730, Samuel Pritchard, member of a constituted lodge in England, published a treatise entitled Masonry Dissected and made oath before the Lord Mayor of London that it was a true copy. Samuel Pritchard maketh oath that the copy hereunto annexed is a true and genuine copy in every particular. In his work he has given the catechism or explanation in question and answer of the apprentice, the fellow craft, and the master mason. There was no difficulty in his doing this as it is a mere form. In his introduction he says, the original institution of masonry consisted in the foundation of the liberal arts and sciences, but more especially on geometry. For at the building of the Tower of Babel, the art and mystery of masonry was first introduced and from thence handed down by Euclid, a worthy and excellent mathematician of the Egyptians. And he communicated it to Hiram, the master mason concerned in building Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Besides the absurdity of deriving masonry from the building of Babel, where according to the story, the confusions of languages prevented builders understanding each other and consequently of communicating any knowledge they had. There is a glaring contradiction in point of chronology in the account he gives. Solomon's temple was built and dedicated 1004 years before the Christian era and Euclid as may be seen in the tables of chronology lived 277 years before the same era. It was therefore impossible that Euclid could communicate anything to Hiram, since Euclid did not live till 700 years after the time of Hiram. In 1783, Captain George Smith, inspector of the Royal Artillery Academy at Woolwich in England and provincial grand master of masonry for the country of Kent, published a treatise entitled The Use and Abuse of Freemasonry. In his chapter of the Antiquity of Masonry, he makes it to be coeval with creation. When he says the sovereign architect raised on Masonic principles the beauteous globe and commanded the master science, geometry, to lay the planetary world and to regulate by its laws the whole stupendous system in just unerring proportion, rolling round the central sun. But he continues, I am not at liberty publicly to undraw the curtain and openly to descant on this head. It is sacred and ever will remain so. Those who are honored with the trust will not reveal it, and those who are ignorant of it cannot betray it. By this last part of the phrase, Smith means the two inferior classes, the fellow craft and the inner apprentice. For he says in the next page of his work, it is not every one that is barely initiated into Freemasonry that is entrusted with all the mysteries 
their two belonging. They are not obtainable as things of course, nor by every capacity. The learned but unfortunate Dr. Dodd, Grand Chaplain of Masonry in his orientation at the dedication of Freemasons Hall, London traces Masonry through a variety of stages. Masons, say he, are well informed from their own private and interior records that the building of Solomon's Temple is an important error. From hence they derive many mysteries of their art. Now, says he, be it remembered that this great event took place above 1,000 years before the Christian era and consequently more than a century before Homer. The first of the Grecian poets wrote and above five centuries before Pythagoras bought from the East his sublime system of truly Masonic instruction to illuminate our Western world. But as remote as this period is, we do not date from thence the commencement of our art. For though it might owe to the wise and glorious King of Israel, some of its mystic forms and hieroglyphic ceremonies, yet certainly the art itself is coeval with man, the great subject of it. We trace, continues he, its footsteps in the most distant, the most remote ages and nations of the world. We find it among the first and most celebrated civilizers of the East. We deduce it regularly from the first astronomers on the plains of Chaldea to the wise and mystic kings and priests of Egypt, the sages of Greece, and the philosophers of Rome. For those reports and declarations of Masons of the highest order in the institution, we see that Masonry without publicly declaring so, lies claim to some divine communication from the Creator in a manner different from and unconnected with the book which the Christians call the Bible. And the natural result from this is that Masonry is derived from some very ancient religion, wholly independent of and unconnected with that book. To come then at once to the point, Masonry as I shall show from the customs, ceremonies, hieroglyphs, and chronology of masonry is derived and is the remains of the religion of the ancient Druids, who like the Magi of Persia and the priest of Heliopolis in Egypt were priests of the sun. They paid worship to this great luminary as the great visible agent of a great invisible first cause whom they styled time without limits. In masonry, many of the ceremonies of the Druids are preserved in the original state, at least without any parody. With them, the sun is still the sun, and his image in the form of the sun is the great emblematic ornament of Masonic lodges and Masonic dresses. It is the central figure on their aprons, and they wear it also pendant on the breast in their lodges and in their procession. At what period of antiquity or in what nation this religion was first established is lost in the labyrinth of unrecorded times. It is generally ascribed to the ancient Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Chaldeans and reduced afterwards to a system regulated by the apparent progress of the sun. Through the twelve signs of the zodiac, by Zoroaster, the lawgiver of Persia, from whence Pythagoras brought it into Greece. It is to these matters Dr. Dodd refers in the passage already quoted from his oration. The worship of the sun as the great visible agent of the great invisible first cause, time without limits, spread itself over a considerable part of Asia and Africa, from thence to Greece and Rome, through all ancient Gaul and into Britain and Ireland. Smith, in his chapter of the Antiquity of Masonry in Britain, says that notwithstanding the obscurity 
which envelopes Masonic history in that country. Various circumstances contribute to prove that Freemasonry was introduced into Britain about 1,300 years before Christ. It cannot be Masonry in its present state that Smith here alludes to. The Druids flourished in Britain at the period he speaks of, and it is from them that Masonry is descended. Smith has put the child in the place of the parent. It sometimes happens, well in writing, as in conversation, that a person lets slip an expression that serves to unravel what he intended to conceal, and this is the case with Smith. For in the same chapter he says, the Druids, when they committed anything to writing, used the Greek alphabet, and I am bold to assert that the most perfect remains of the Druid rites and ceremonies are preserved in the customs and ceremonies of the Masons that are to be found existing among mankind. My brethren, says he, may be able to trace them with greater exactness than I am at liberty to explain to the public. This is a confession from a master mason without intending it to be so, understood by the public that masonry is the remains of the religion of the Druids. The reason for the Masons keeping this a secret I shall explain in the course of this work. As the study and contemplation of the Creator in the works of the creation, of which the Son, as the great visible agent of that being, was the visible object of the adoration of Druids. All the religious rites and ceremonies had references to the apparent progress of the Son through the twelve signs of the zodiac and his influence upon the earth. The Masons have adopted the same practices. The roof of their temples or lodges is ornamented with a sun and the floor is a representation of the variegated face of the earth, either by carpeting or Masonic work. Freemasons Hall in Great Queen Street, Lincoln's Inn Fields, London is a magnificent building and cost upwards of 12,000 pounds sterling. Smith, in speaking of this building, says on page 152, the roof of this magnificent hall is, in all probability, the highest piece of furniture architecture in Europe. In the center of this roof, a most resplendent sun is represented in burnished gold, surrounded with the 12 signs of the zodiac, with the representative characters. After giving this description, he says, the emblematic meaning of the sun is well known to the enlightened and inquisitive Freemason. And as the real sun is situated in the center of the universe, so, the emblematic sun is the center of real masonry. We all know, continues he, that the sun is the foundation of light, the source of the seasons, the cause of the vicissitude of day and night, the parent of vegetation, the friend of man. Hence, the scientific Freemason only knows the reason why the sun is placed in the center of this beautiful hall. The Masons, in order to protect themselves from the persecution of the Christian Church, have always spoken in a mystical manner of the figure of the sun in their lodges. Or, like the astronomer Lalonde, who is a Mason, been silent upon the subject. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating through PayPal or Patreon. The links are in the description.